everybody. Uh, so today I'd like to talk about the content design of civil discourse, how you can turn conflict into collaboration. Uh, my name is, well, we'll see if this ever goes anywhere. Okay, so slide's not going forward, but uh, I can tell you the next slide is uh, about me being David Dylan Thomas. Um, and I, uh, there's an on switch. Um, I, uh, my job is to go around and give people uh, better tools for, there we go, uh, better tools for, and really just get them excited about more inclusive design. And I wrote this book, Design for Cognitive Bias, about that. Now, I want to start by telling you about an experiment. And the way it works is you get an audience and you show them a photo like this, and you ask, how, uh, uh, should this person drive this car? And what you'll get is basically a policy debate. Some people will say, oh, old people are bad at everything. Don't let them drive. And other people will say, how dare you? That's ageist. Let people do what they want. All you're going to learn by the end of that conversation is who's on what side. Now, I can show the exact same photo to another audience and ask, how might this person drive this car? And what you'll get is basically a design discussion. And some people will say, what if we change the shape of the steering wheel? Or what if we move the dashboard? And what you learn by the end of that conversation is several different ways that person might be able to drive that car. Now, online and in person, we've gotten very good at the should conversation. I can go on Twitter right now and tell you exactly who's on what side. What we're not so good at is the how conversation. Now, Robert Fersh, who created the uh, Converge Center for Public Policy in DC, whose mission is basically to get people from opposite sides of the table to come to the same table, says this about founding the policy, the, the Public Policy Center. Over a period of years, I kept meeting people of great decency who had different worldviews, but there wasn't a place where they could meet to bring out the best in each other and find answers that each hadn't considered. Now, there are a few key phrases there I want to highlight. People of great decency. Often when we disagree with people, we think they don't have any decency because if they did, well, of course they'd agree with us. Um, wasn't a place. The actual location or the design of the location of where we have these discussions matters, and that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today. Best in each other. Again, we often think there isn't a best to bring out in the other person. And finally, hadn't considered. This is crucial. We often go into these conversations thinking, we've already considered all of the angles. What more could there be to consider? And that is a critical mistake. Now, I don't know how many 80s films fans we have in the audience, but you may recognize this as Thunderdome from Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, a post-apocalyptic gladiatorial arena where the phrase is, one, two men enter, one man leave. And this is very much how we view public debate today, right? We look at political discourse as a zero-sum game. There has to be a winner. There has to be a loser. Part of the reason for this is something called the fundamental attribution error. And the way it works is if I were to see somebody uh, run a red light, I might think to myself, oh, what a scofflaw, what a terrible driver. They're so impatient. They're dangerous. If I run a red light, oh, I was uh, late for work. Yeah, there was someone honking behind me. Um, I attribute their behavior to something about them personally. I attribute my behavior to my circumstances. It never occurs to me that they might be late for work. Now, uh, George Carlin has a great joke about this. He says, anybody who drives slower than you is an idiot. Anybody who drives faster than you is a crazy person. Now, you can apply the same philosophy to politics. Anybody who is more conservative than you is a bigot. Anybody who is more liberal than you is a hippy-dippy. But you, you're God's perfect creature. <laughs> if only everyone would do what you say, everything would be fine. Now, you picture two people going into conversation with that attitude. They are never going to get anything done. To put it another way, If aliens were to come down and try to guess the purpose of the internet by observing us use the internet, they would quickly come to the conclusion that the internet is where you go to find people who are doing it wrong and tell them they're doing it wrong. A great example of this came during the controversy over Starbucks when they decided that they wanted to have a conversation with us about race. So your barista would write hashtag race together on your coffee cup and hand it to you. And then, I don't know, you'd talk about Rodney King. I have no idea 
what was supposed to happen, and neither did Starbucks, but what did happen was that Twitter lost its damn mind. Which, of course it did. This is a very tone-deaf approach to having a conversation about race. But what didn't happen was this. There was no question around what does a productive conversation about race actually look like? Because if we ask that question, then we can talk about how to actually have one. Clearly, it was not writing race on a coffee cup, but what was it? What was the thing we were comparing it to? Now, if you were to actually say, hey, I want to design for a good conversation, you can take a look at Ronnie Polineski, who's a, a reporter in Philadelphia who went to an urban park in Philadelphia and sat down with two chairs and one sign. And the sign said, I will listen without without, with compassion, without judgment, with an open heart. So, is there something you need to say? Tell me, I will listen. Sits down and person after person comes into that other chair and unburdens themselves. And she tells the story that often people would sit down and say, I'm just going to take a minute of your time. And then an hour later, right, they had said their life story and said their piece, right? So this was designed specifically to elicit a productive conversation. And that's the point. You get the conversation you design for. Now, this can even come down to color. So there's an experiment where you have people sit down at a computer and do different kinds of tasks. Some people are doing detail-oriented tasks like proofreading. Other people are doing more creative tasks like brainstorming to come up with ideas. You also have randomly a blue background for that work or a red background for that work. The folks who had a red background for the detail-oriented tasks like proofreading found 30% more errors. The folks who had a blue background for creative work like brainstorming came out with twice as many ideas. So if you're designing a system for people to come together and think creatively, what color choices do you want to think about? Even the objects in the room can have an influence. If you were having an in-person meeting and there was a briefcase visible, people will act more competitive than if it were, say, a backpack. This can even influence the kind of imagery you might want to use on your website. Even things like money, right, whether it's a dollar sign or a particular color of green, people reminded of money are less interpersonally attuned. They are not pro-social, caring, or warm. So if you want any of those things in your interactions, you might want to be careful about what kind of imagery you use. This idea of design influencing behavior should not be new to us, right? If you go to a restaurant and there's all this soft lighting and nice classical music playing and very clean, beautiful cutlery, this is not the sort of place that you think you should drop the F-bomb as loudly as possible. On the other hand, if you were to go to a uh, dingy bar, right, and it's like really noisy and everything's kind of dirty, you might think this is a place that actively wants you to curse as loudly as possible. Now, the same thing is true online. If I go to Medium with its cool blues and greens and pristine typography, I might think this is a place where I should kind of class it up a little bit. If I go to the comment section of YouTube or Reddit, I might think this place doesn't care at all how I conduct myself. It's as if it were saying we put the least amount of effort possible into how this place looks, so you should put the least amount of effort possible into how you conduct yourself. Now, I had the opportunity to talk to someone from Medium to see if this was just my theory or if this was actually deliberate, and they said, absolutely deliberate. In fact, if you want to comment on someone's post on Medium, you don't say, the button doesn't say post, it says publish. Oh, I'm publishing. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me, let me bring my A game. Now, there are lots of ways to think about trying to make that discussion more civil. There's literally an app called Civil Comments. It's a plugin, and the way it works is if you want to comment on someone's post, you first have to rate three other comments. Now, this has a curious effect. First of all, it forces you to acknowledge that there is such a thing as a good or a bad comment. But then it makes you apply your own standard to that. And we will adhere to our own standards far more strictly than we will to any standard someone hands to us. And so what people would do is they would go to the website, uh, comment on a post, or um, uh, rate a post, and maybe rate it poorly, and then go back to their post and see that they did the same thing. 
and then change their post. In fact, the majority of people who went through this process would go back and edit their comments before they posted it. Who does that, right? By the way, another effect, if I'm rating someone else's comment, someone's gonna rate my comment. So again, I'm encouraged to up my game. Now, unfortunately, civil comments is no more. It failed to find a uh, coherent business model. And when I told a friend of mine this, he said, there are more tools that we need than there are business models for. So we need to start thinking very carefully about how to make sure these things get to exist, whether there's a good business model or not. Fortunately, this one is still with us. It's called Rethink. Uh, Trisha Prabhu was 14 years old when she got into the Google Science Fair with this project. And what it basically does is it notices, hey, that thing you're about to post to social media, if you're about to post something hateful, Rethink detects it and says, literally just pops up two sentences, uh, Rethink has detected that this might be hurtful to somebody. Are you sure you want to post it? In the test group, which was adolescence, by the way, not the greatest impulse control, over 90% of the people who saw that pop-up stopped and did not post the hateful thing. Now, this tells us a couple things. First, most of the people out there are not evil. They are simply thoughtless. It does not occur to them that there was a human being on the other side of that comment. The second you remind them of that, they back off. The other thing this tells us is it only takes two sentences to stop them. We're sitting here lamenting the state of social media, saying it is an unsolvable problem. Two sentences from a 14-year-old, I think we can do this. Another great tool to use here is question design. So that policy center I was telling you about before, Converge, again, they have to get people who hate each other to come to the same table. One of the tools in their tool belt is question design. So if the issue were food deserts, which if you don't know are basically places usually in urban centers where there's simply not access to healthy food, a question you might think would be appropriate is how can we get healthier food into the supermarket? This, strangely, is a very divisive question. It has a lot of assumptions baked in. What they might ask is, how can we work together to shift consumer demand to healthier consumption? You see what they did there? Shift consumer demand. If my primary interest in food is monetary and you say the words shift consumer demand, I'm thinking, oh, I can get in on the ground floor of that before anyone else gets there. Tell me how I can help. Healthier consumption. If I live in the community, if I work with the community, healthier consumption, yes, please tell me more. How can I help? Anyone you want at the table can see themselves in the question. But that's not even the best part. Look at the beginning of the question. How can we work together? I cannot answer the question lest I also describe working together. Let's go back to our initial question. How might this person drive this car? It's good enough. But what if I asked, how do we do a better job of moving people around? Because that's why she was in the car in the first place. She was here, but she wanted to be over there. And if I frame it this way, things like public transportation are on the table. If you want to craft these more inclusive questions, start with this. For any should question, try to understand what the goal of the proposed solution is, and then frame a how question around that goal. With should this person drive this car, the goal of that, presumably, is safer driving. Okay, we'll answer that question then. How do we get safer transportation? How do we get safer moving people around? And you'll notice if you answer that how question, get the answer to the should question for free. Another problem we have is that our reactions online are extremely binary, right? Very linear. So I can say, yes, that's awesome, or oh, that's terrible. But I can't really ideate on anything. There's no, hey, I want to try to explore this button. If there were, what might that do? Well, in real life, there's an exercise called 8-Up uh, that tries to generate good ideas from multiple people. And the way it works is you get eight people in a room, and you ask them some sort of design question, like how might we do a better job of moving people around? And you say, each of you has three minutes to write down three ideas how do we do a better job of moving people around? Three minutes are up, now I've got eight people with three ideas each, and I say, great. Turn to your neighbor, show them your three ideas. They will show you their three ideas. You got 10 minutes, take those six ideas, whittle them down to two. 
10 minutes goes by, now I've got pairs of people with two ideas each. I say, great, turn to the pair next to you, show them your two ideas, they will show you their two ideas, take those four ideas, whittle them down to two. And you can see where this is going. By the end, I've got eight people, four ideas between them, they're gonna whittle that down to one idea. Now the beauty of this is they've done research and if I want a great idea and I say I put eight people in a room and say you can't come out until you come up with a good idea, I'm gonna get a mediocre idea. Or I can say, hey, eight people, each of you come up with an idea, we'll vote on the best one. I'm gonna get a mediocre idea. But if I progressively combine the DNA of everyone's lived truth into that final idea, I can get a great idea. Now this approach has a few advantages. First off, it mutes the loud talkers. I think we've all been in those collaboration sessions where there's one person, usually a dude, who's really taking over and dominating the conversation. This mutes that because in the first round, they aren't talking to anybody. And in the second round, there's really only one person they're talking to. And by the time they have the chance to dominate the entire conversation, everybody's ideas have already filtered into the, that final piece. Another thing this does is because everybody's lived truth has made it into that final idea, there's a lot more buy-in when you finally produce that idea because everyone can see a little piece of themselves in it. Finally, if you do decide to take this approach, it is very important to have what I call both horizontal and vertical diversity. Horizontal diversity being I want IT, marketing, HR, I want everybody across the organization involved. But also vertical diversity, I want the CEO in the room and I want the person that's their first day. This is literally a million dollar approach. The Netflix uh, design competition, the Netflix prize, which you can tell by the actual design of that website how old this is, but uh, they were gonna give you a million dollars if you could improve their recommendation algorithm by 10%. The winning team was actually two different teams who joined forces when they each saw they had a piece of the puzzle. The second place team, was also two different teams that joined together when they each saw they had a piece of the puzzle. I can only imagine what would have happened if all four had gotten together. Now online, this might look something like V Taiwan. V Taiwan came about when the Taiwanese government was gonna impose a tax law that was gonna give China more power over Taiwan. It's similar to the conflict that Hong Kong had recently. And so there were a bunch of protests and a bunch of student protests, and the students actually occupied Taiwanese parliament. Instead of bringing out the tear gas, the Taiwanese parliament said, hey, leader of this movement, would you like to be on the cabinet? They created a cabinet position for her, something like internet czar or something, and together they created this process called V Taiwan. Now, it is a very complicated process, but the objective is to crowdsource policy. So I want to tell you about two key design decisions they made that kept this from turning into a shouting match. So you start with an issue. Let's say the issue is ride sharing. Taiwan had the exact same issues with Uber as any other country. And you would put out a statement, like I think that anybody who uh, drives a ride sharing car should need a license to do so. And this would go out in the form of texts. And the only possible response was agree, disagree, or pass. There was no reply button. Let me say that again, there was no reply button. Think about what this does to trolling. If I want to reply with some hateful statement just to get a rise out of you, I can't, there's no reply button. Now you could post your own statement for people to respond to, but again, they could only agree, disagree, or pass. So if I want to post something hateful just to see all the people commenting, getting upset, I can't, there's no reply button. So that was one move that added friction to trolling. But you also need to incentivize consensus, and that's where we get to our second design decision. Rather than just showing a list of Bob said yes, Jane said no, I see what groups of people said, right? And some groups, a statement will light up with just, light, light up just one group. Some statements, two or three groups will light up. It feels better. And you'll notice, if I something, say something really extreme or, or, or hateful, um, at best, I'll get one group to light up. If I want two or three groups to light up, I have to come up with something a little more nuanced that finds a little more common ground. So what you would find is that you might start off with four groups, say, 
uh, Uber drivers, Uber passengers, taxi drivers, taxi passengers. But as you start to see these alignments, those groups would merge into maybe two groups, pro and anti-Uber. And eventually, you would find statements that even those two groups both agreed with. Here's one. We think that the five-star rating system that applies to Uber should also apply to taxis because we think that's one of the things that actually makes Uber good. So taking that and filtering it through the whole process, what you eventually arrive at is exactly the policy that Taiwan implemented. They said, look, we're going to take the technology out of Ubers and put it in taxis. That is a much more nuanced solution that you would not get to by arguing about it on Twitter or arguing about it in Parliament, right? But I think those key design decisions that were meant to add friction to trolling and incentivize consensus were critical. Uh, Tom Atlee did a series of blog posts on this, which I think are really insightful. He said, for wisdom, we need to treat our differences as a resource that can help us consider more what, of what needs to be considered. In the wise democracy paradigm, defeating an opponent rather than tapping and integrating their piece of the truth is a tragic waste. Put more simply, it's the difference between generating winners and generating wisdom. You have to decide. And I should caution you, you need to be sure that your business model has made that decision. Because some business models, many social media business models, are actually more interested in generating winners. They make much more money off of the engagement that comes from conflict than the productive discourse that would come from generating wisdom. Now, I want to close by giving you a case study of how this works in the real world. So I can't use real names, but I promise this is a true story. Francis facilitates meetings where people decide how to distribute millions in federal funding, this is in the United States, in federal funding for at-risk populations in a major metropolitan city. And what Francis is running into is status quo bias. This group keeps spending the money in the same way, which at first is good. These are people in need, they get their needs met. But as you may know, needs shift over time. So as these new needs emerge, the funding is still going to the old need. So they decided to change the agenda of the meeting design and the actual design of the place where the meeting took, happened. So start with the old agenda. The old agenda was everyone who came to this meeting would be handed a big giant document that had lots of charts and graphs and budget numbers and they would walk through that document. And next would come a Q&A Q &A where nobody would ask any questions because they had just been handed a big massive document. And then they would do a working budgeting lunch where they would come to the exact same conclusions they did every other time. For the new agenda, they started with a budget-free document because remember, people reminded of money are not pro-social. And if I'm trying to decide how to help people in need, I don't want you being anti-social. And they did some pre-meeting data training so that when the people came in the room, they knew how to engage with these charts and graphs. And as a result, they would then have a Q&A with actual questions because people felt empowered to engage with this data. Then they would go through what is essentially a, an eight, a version of that eight up meeting I told you about, where they would try to prioritize what are the key needs here that we want to focus on. Then they would sort those needs by money needs and not money needs because not every need is in fact solvable with money. Then they would do a non-working lunch. And this is critical because there's something called decision fatigue. And the way it works is every decision you make takes energy. And the more decisions you make, the less energy you have. And the quality of those decisions goes down. Unfortunately, this is true in judging. If you go into a courtroom, they took, did a study, they looked at the judge's decisions. And at the beginning of the day, the judge would be handing out maybe 65% favorable decisions, right? They just had breakfast, they come in, they start the day. And then as the day went on, it would drop to nearly zero before lunch. They would come back from lunch and then magically it would be back to 65% and then start dropping again. Now, this should terrify all of us because that's people's lives that are being judged by hanger, but in this situation it made sense to say, hey everybody, just take lunch. Get to know each other, right? Don't worry about any of that stuff. Now, finally, make the budget decisions. We went to the last possible minute to really talk about the money. So those were the changes to the agenda, but they also changed the space. So this was held in a room that had maybe 100 chairs in it. It's very hard to move around. And when people feel confined, they are not creative, they are not collaborative. There was no room to move. So 
they actually had these nice big windows in the room, and as it turns out, people like to be near light, especially natural light, but you couldn't get to the windows because, again, there's no room to move. The seating style was kind of like this lecture style, so everybody facing one direction, which is not very good for collaboration, and there was no green space. There was nothing alive in the room, no plants. It did not feel like a space used by human beings. And I think we've all had meetings and meeting spaces that look like they were built for robots to have meetings. So Francis wrote a book uh, called Joyful by Ingrid Fatal Lee, which talks a lot about how uh, environment influences behavior. And so they made some changes. By the way, they did this in one day. <laughs> uh, fewer chairs, 100 chairs in the room, but only like 50 people show up for this meeting. So they took out half the chairs, and now you can move around, right? And now you have access to that wonderful light, those big windows. And they put a couple really comfy chairs near those windows, so maybe I show up before the meeting and I kind of hang out, get some work done, or maybe I hang out after. And this is important because that social time is really critical for people to be able to trust each other. And again, if I'm making money decisions for at-risk populations, I need you to trust each other. Semicircular chair, chair arrangement, right? So rather than facing the stage, now you're facing each other, right? And that's much better for collaboration. Plants, they actually got some life into that room, right? And one of my favorite choices, there was a coat rack that used to be at the back of the room, and nobody would ever use it. So they took it, they moved it to the front of the room, and they seated it with their work sweaters. So when you first walk in, you see this coat rack with some sweaters on it, you would take off your coat and put it on there. And the signal this would send is that this is a space used by human beings. All of those changes resulted in actually changing how the funding was spent from year to year. They actually started targeting it more towards these emerging needs. Marvelous technology is at our disposal. And instead of reaching up for new heights, we try to see how far down we can go. Says so Eric Bogosian in talk radio back in the 1980s. He was talking about radio, but he might as well have been talking about the internet. So I'm going to propose three rules that we can use as we enter into conversations that if we can agree to these rules, our odds of having a productive conversation will go up tremendously. Rule number one, neither of us has the answer. If we did, we wouldn't need to have this conversation. And making this assumption guarantees that we'll actually learn something in the course of this conversation. Rule number two, neither of us will win. And this is hard because we're used to winning. Winning feels good. But here's the thing, winning isn't what we're here to do, right? If it is, great, but that's another website, that's another conversation. If you actually want to have a conversation, well, neither of us is going to win. And winning doesn't really help. All winning does is make one of us feel better for a little while until the same ugly problem rears its head again because we were too busy winning to actually solve it. And finally, we are here to create something new. This assumes the best in each of us and that we're going to bring that out. So the next time you see somebody doing it wrong, I want you to ask yourself if there's a how conversation to be had. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Do you want to stand there? Do you think that this is a good, yeah. I'd like good for a good conversation? The yellow, I I'm feeling the yellow. It's making me kind of hungry. No, it's good. Okay. <laughs> I, I can move it. No. You ended with some principles for a good conversation. Uh, if I'm meeting with someone who's not bought into them, what advice would you have for us to start shifting them? How do I begin that? Uh, I would do it before the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> if we're already talking and you're not bought in, there's nothing I can say or do that'll make you bought in. If you want to use that time wisely, I would listen to you and make sure that you felt heard, because at the very least, then now we have a foundation for some kind of relationship. If you don't feel heard in that conversation, you're going to feel disrespected, and someone who feels disrespected isn't going to pay attention to anything you have to say anyway, and they certainly aren't going to agree to any rules that you lay down. So if we're not already at that point, the best I could do is at least listen and see if then there's some common ground to be had. Yeah, and then you know more about me, and then you could maybe have a better meeting next time. Um, is it always, I was thinking about this, I was going to bring a, an example of a uh, should question that's happening in Sweden right now, and how it might become a how question, and then I felt, no, I don't want to give that conversation space, nah. and <laughs> the buttons. So my question to you is, are there no cases where we should fight, shame, 
or cancel something? Is it always about a good conversation? Sure, and there's a longer version of this talk where I really get into how we talk about race in the United States and how that is a very should-based conversation and the limitations of that approach, uh, and how there are, basically, if all you do is cancel somebody, um, you're never gonna make progress because all you're doing is putting people in social jail and we're never actually getting to a point where people get to have those actual productive conversations about race and everything becomes, are you racist or are you not? Which mm. it is important to point out the bad behavior when it happens, but much like we talk about restorative justice, if all I can do is throw you in jail, we're not gonna get anywhere. Um, what I would say then is that, um, Sorry, what was your question again? Uh, well, my, my concern was, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, there's a thing yeah, I don't even know if the I other, want to talk about on stage because yeah, I don't yeah. want to give it space. So the other, the other thing I would say, though, and this is critical, if the person you are trying to have that discussion with does not acknowledge your humanity or other people's humanity, we're done. Like, it's not even worth it. That, that is a do not give it space. Um, by the way, an example I do have, and again, I don't know if this is many controversial here, but in my workshops, I do actually try to take people through an exercise of taking a should question and turning it into a how question. So the one I use is, should billionaires exist? Can you turn that into a question where both billionaires and anti-capitalists would actually want to come to the same table? And some of my most successful groups are able to deconstruct that question into something along the lines of, how can we make sure that everybody has what they need to thrive? Right? Because that's theoretically why you're even bringing up the subject of billionaires is because that's kind of getting in the way of people thriving. That then becomes a question that theoretically both billionaires and anti-capitalists would both want to take part in. Hmm. As you were giving the talk, um, I was thinking there's such a great mix of examples from different domains. And I was wondering, is there, is there a discipline, like a, a good conversation architecture discipline? Is, where would, would one find this sort of thing? Um, well, there is. I mean. I'll toot my own book, but uh, Conversation Design by Erica Hall is actually very much about this idea of designing a conversation, understanding that the design of the conversation is, in fact, one of the critical factors in how that conversation goes. It isn't just, oh, all people are grumpy and they'll yell at each other if you put them in a room. No, the design of the room makes a big difference. So I think that's one sort of domain that crosses all these domains is conversation design. But there is also something, a, a lot of the examples you give, there's a cleverness in how, the, how a question is posed. Mm -hmm. It's not about chairs and colors in the room. Uh, how would one start so to approach that? So that's something called the framing effect, which in my opinion is both the most dangerous and kind of the most productive bias there is. Because I can use framing, like here's an example of framing. Um, should we go to war in April or should we go to war in May? <laughs> right, see what I did there? We're not discussing whether it's a good idea to go to war in the first place. But that same you know, device, that framing device, is how we get to the, how can we make sure people thrive? How can we make sure, you know, turn it into a more of a, a collaborative discussion? But that is, like, look up framing effect, because that's all that is. You see it in advertising, you see it in politics, but you also see it in social discourse and social justice. Thank you so much, David. My pleasure. A big applause for David Dylan Thomas. Thank you. Thank you.